So this chapter is called Cratered Worlds, and it's really just dealing with uh, Mercury and the Moon. Um, those are the, sort of the major cratered worlds that we'll talk about. Um, the, Mercury and the Moon have a lot in common, as you'll see. Um, they certainly look a lot alike. They also have some big differences. A vocabulary for the chapter is just a little bit. Um, there'll probably be a few words that aren't in here, but on this list, but the highlands. So the moon has lowlands and highlands. The lowlands are called mare, and they're the dark areas you see when you look at the moon from Earth. And the highlands are the light colored areas. The highlands are typically higher, like a mile higher or something like that, and, uh, and sort of more mountainy. And the, the mare, mare is like the Latin word for sea. Mare is the plural. Um, and so uh, they're, they're, they're lowlands. They're, they're, they're sort of volcanic plains, you might say. A scarp is sort of a long ridge that occurs when uh, a planet is cooling and contracting and the crust kind of wrinkles a little bit. I'll identify a few scarps for you. So let's talk about just some general uh, facts about the Moon and Mercury that's in these tables. Um, you see the Moon on the left in the top table and Mercury on the right. And uh, first of all, the, you know, this, the, the first line says their mass, right? And uh, if the Earth is, is 1, then the Moon's mass is 0 0.0123, which means about 1 and a quarter percent of the mass of the Earth. So the Moon is really a tiny mass-wise object compared to the Earth. Even though it's a quarter of the Earth's diameter, it's only about one and a half, one and a quarter percent of the Earth's mass. Similarly, Mercury is only about five and a half percent of the Earth's mass. If the Earth is one, Mercury is 0 0.055. Their diameter, I'll give you their diameters in miles. So uh, the, uh, the diameter of the Moon is about 2,000 miles. That's 3476 kilometers, and the diameter of Mercury is about 3,000 miles, about half again as big as, as the Moon. Here are the densities. The densities are the things that give you kind of a flavor of what they're composed of, and you can see the densities are very different. Remember, the density of water in grams per cubic centimeter that you see over here on the left is 1, and so the Moon's density is about 3.3, it's about the density of rock. Uh, Mercury's density is roughly the same as the density of the Earth. The Earth's average density is 5.5, and that means it's about halfway between rock and iron. So there's a lot of metal in the Mercury. The Mercury, turns out, has a very large iron core. The surface gravity, if the Earth's gravity is 1, then the Moon's gravity is about 17% of that, and, uh, and Mercury's is uh, uh, 3.8 on that scale. So you know, if we were playing basketball on the moon, you could jump about six times as high on the moon as you could on Earth. I would have mad ups on the moon. Escape velocity, so we don't have to be too concerned with that, but um, escape velocity on the Earth, in order to, to, to just escape the Earth's gravity, you have to be traveling about 11 kilometers per second. This is 2.4, and so it'd be a lot easier to escape the moon. That's why it wasn't that hard for the astronauts and the Apollo program to launch themselves out. Um, rotation period. Remember we learned that the rotation period of the Moon is about the same as its orbital period around the Earth, so it's about a month. Um, Mercury's rotation period is even slower than that. It's about 58 Earth days. Um, so the, the, the next table here, which I included, is uh, just some details about the, the Apollo project. Um, what, what we're doing with that, these are the, the first sort of really big missions to the Moon, and they all sent humans and Apollo 17 down here at the bottom was the last time an American walked on the moon. I think anybody walked on the moon. Um, other countries are now talking about it. And there have been lots of other missions to the moon since then. Many, many countries have sent, um, some landed, lots of orbiters. Um, I don't think anybody's put a person on there since then. I know they haven't. So Apollo 8 was, uh, they flew around the moon. Um, I don't know why they don't have Apollo 9 there. Um, Apollo 10 was a rendezvous in, in, in orbit, the first spacecraft's meet, because that was part of the process where these guys had to, um, Apollo 11 was where they landed off on the moon, and so the, the lunar lander had to send a, a part of itself back up into space to meet the orbiter, and they had to recombine, so that was practiced in Apollo 10. So, so Apollo 11 in July of uh, 1969 was the first moon landing, 
and all these other guys landed on the moon except Apollo 13. You might have watched that movie, and if you didn't, you should. But you can see they were doing lots of little things here. In Apollo 11, they put a... Uh, they, they, so they're always bringing back different kinds of rocks. A big part of this was collecting materials for... Um, uh, to study on Earth so we could learn about moon rocks. Uh, and so um, later on they were carrying, you know, a kilogram is 2.2 pounds, so 95 kilograms is 210 pounds of rocks, and then 111 kilograms by 240 pounds of rocks. Uh, so they were trying very hard to get a good sampling of rocks from all kinds of different areas. You see they were landing in different places. Um, they were landing in highlands and lowlands. And... Uh, to try to get as, as wide a sample of, uh, of the moon as, as they possibly could. Like I said, there have been many, many more moon uh, uh, missions since then. Um, so general properties of the moon, um, so described as what, what was learned uh, from space lunar exploration. We brought back many rocks. We learned all kinds of things from these rocks. But one of the things we learned was how old, we could radiometrically date the rocks, and that would tell us how old the different regions of the moon were, and then we could look at the cratering rates on those different regions and correlate cratering rates to ages, and then that allowed us to look at the ages of surfaces, other surfaces that had craters, you know, with the same density, and then we could figure out, just by looking at craters, how old things were in the solar system, and so it was, it was very important for that. Um, Many experiments, they did seismology experiments. Some went on for years afterwards. We put reflectors on the moon that allows us to, allows us to bounce laser beams off the moon, which we still do daily. Um, we photographed the lunar surfaces from orbiters. The total program, Apollo program cost $100 per American spread out over 10 years. So $10 a year for 10 years for every American. So it was pricey, but we did a lot of really cool stuff there. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the composition and structure of the moon. The moon has a rocky surface and a mantle and a small metal core. Um, the Earth's core is much larger by comparison. Um, the moon has ice in its polar craters, which are permanently in shadow. Um, this is discovered by smashing a small spacecraft into a crater. And look at what came up. They intentionally smashed a crater in to see if they could get some... Uh, rock to come out, and when it did, ice underneath it came out, so they were able to see what it was. Um, there's enough water in the craters to fill a lake 100 miles across, and so in the future, if we decide we want to have missions to the moon where we land on it, we could choose to use that water instead of bringing water. Um, so the, the lunar surface, let's talk a little bit about the lunar surface. So this is Buzz Aldrin. He was the second man to land on the moon, and he's looking at uh, the, f the flag they just planted. Uh, so this is a nice picture of, you know, this is the, f the, on the left is the face of the moon that we always see. Remember when we talked about the moon, we said the moon always keeps one face towards the Earth. Well, this is the back side of the moon, the side that faces away from the Earth, and you can see it's very different. There's lots of mare on the, on the left half, but not so many, just one little one on the right. By the way, if you look at these mare, you can see that they're pretty circular. These are actually due to impact craters at the end of the cratering ring era, so they were big impacts. And uh, they cracked sort of the lunar surface and, and lunar lava poured out, and that's why it's dark there. And so when you look at mare, which we'll see I think a little later, um, they're pretty smooth. They're not heavily cratered like the, like the highlands. Look at the bottom of the left picture and you can see all these craters down here. Or just look at the right picture and look at all the craters on the highlands versus what's in the mare. Um, these, cr these impacts, you can tell, happened very late. They erased all the craters, and then there weren't very many after that. And so you can tell how old a surface is by the density of the craters and how they overlap and stuff like that. So that's a nice picture for that. Um, these are just pictures taken uh, um, on the moon. Uh, this is a scientist ha analyzing a moon rock. They used gloves and did a lot of things where they weren't touching, contaminating. You don't want to get your own minerals on these rocks that you're trying to understand. Um, here's a Saturn V rocket that's in the Johnson Space Center in Houston. It used to be outside. They moved it inside, I think it says. Um, we went there but a very long time ago. Uh, this is a, this is a, 
a mountain inside a, a crater, inside the Tico crater, which maybe we'll get to here in a second. So if you look at this crater in the, in the upper right, in, in the center here, um, you can see some mountains in the center of it. So when you have an impact, there's a recoil. And so lots of craters that haven't somehow been eroded later have, have uh, central peaks, central bumps, that are a telltale sign that they're a crater, not say the, a dead volcano or something like that. Here's another nice picture of a crater. This is uh, this is Copernicus. Look how this is in Amare. Look how smooth Amare is, other than where the, the crater is. Lots of smooth open areas, right? This the, the event that caused this mare that, that you see all around here, not the little crater in the middle, but the mare happened very late. There weren't very many bombardments after that. By the way, this crater at the top, at the very top here, is called Tico. Oh, Copernicus. Sorry, Copernicus. And you can see that there's some light lines that sort of radiate outward from it. Um, if you look at Tycho from a different angle, you can see it was a massive explosion and uh, and uh, stuff blew outward and made marks um, indicating that. All right, let me switch back. Um, so, uh, differentiation, differentiate between the lunar surface, Maria lower and darker, a few craters, their volcanic plains, Terry are, are uh, older and larger, you know, 4.1 to 4.4 billion years ago. The, the cratering era ended about 3.3 .3 billion years ago. As I say, we don't see a lot of craters after that. And so the moon hasn't changed much in that time. Um, the lunar soil, if you want to call it soil, it's often called regolith, which means blanket of stone. Uh, since the moon has no atmosphere, all the things we call shooting stars and stuff, miniature meteorites, um, are just sandblasted surface. And so its surface has the consistency of powder. Um, it's very soft. So, uh, as I was saying a minute ago, we know the we know the craters are from impacts and not from volcanoes because of the central peak, that recoil peak. Uh, there was there was debated maybe more than a hundred years ago about whether or not those craters were actually craters of volcanoes, and probably debated for a long time. But the central peaks are, are the big tip. We can create craters with the central peak by shooting cannonballs at the ground and stuff like that. Um, the moon is a, a, a nighttime temperature of minus 98 degrees Fahrenheit, approximately, it varies, and 224 degrees above boiling in the daytime. This is, the moon really isn't significantly farther away from the sun than we are, so it gets about the same sunlight that we do. Um, and so the question of why it gets such radical weather compared to ours is because we have an atmosphere and it doesn't. The atmosphere keeps us warm at night and cool in the day, and so it's a... Uh, um, the atmosphere saves us from a lot of things. It also saves us from being bombarded by radiation and meteorites and stuff like that. Um, so this is the youngest lunar impact basin uh, called Oriental. It formed about 3.8 billion years ago. Um, you can see these outer rings on it. It looks like a bullseye, right? It's got layers of rings and stuff. And the, and the inner one is... Uh, Got, got a lava flow in it. So this is a massive impact. Um, the outer rings diameter is about 600 miles or something like that, a thousand kilometers it said. Um, so it was not completely filled by the lava flows just at the very center. Right. Here's a picture of a footprint which will be there probably for a very long time. So this is, uh, this is on the left is a volcano and on the right is an impact crater and they look different and you can sort of see the central peak on the impact crater. Um, impacts, craters are much bigger than the rocks they made them, that make them and so um, you can see a small rock coming in here it creates this impact. There should be a recoil peak here in the center but this, the hole that gets made is a lot bigger than the uh, than the impactor that made it. There's some central peaks on this guy
Yeah, it's often easier to see the, the, the region between dark and light, that boundary between dark and light is called the Terminator. Um, has nothing to do with Arnold Schwarzenegger. And the Terminator, um, because the light is kind of going tangent to the surface, if you look on the Terminator, you often get to see a lot, a really good view of craters. It's harder to see them on a full moon. And so when we look through the moon at a telescope, we're often looking right along the Terminator to see what kind of craters we can see, because that's where the interesting stuff is. Um, here's a picture of moon from the Deep Space Climate Observatory. Uh, it's it's uh, about a million miles in the direction of the sun from the Earth, and so you get a nice picture of the relative size of the moon and the Earth and from that picture. Here's the uh, meteor crater that we talked about last time, a nice example of a crater. This is a picture of, uh, this is a graph here of, uh, of the cratering era. And so let me see if I can explain this. So, so the horizontal axis is time before present in billions of years. So if zero is present, then one is a billion years ago, two is two billion years ago, three is three billion years ago, four is four billion years ago, and the Earth is about four and a half billion years old. And what we see when we look at craters is there's lots of, lots of these craters fall in this age group over four billion years old, and it starts to end somewhere back here as the solar system was forming. And roughly around 3.3 gets, there's almost no craters for the last three billion years. We still get them, but very, very few. And so, um, so this is just part of the formation of the solar system, all these craters that happened to the moon. The Earth got just as many, um, more because it's bigger, um, but uh, we erased our craters. So let's talk about the origin of the moon. So there's three major hypotheses for the origin of the moon. All of them are basically wrong. The fission theory says that, you know, uh, um, part of the material that was forming the Earth split off, was thrown out and made the moon. Right? The question is, why do we have a moon? Notice, uh, you know, there are seven big moons in the solar system. Jupiter has four, Saturn has one, Neptune has one, and we have one. And we're a little bitty planet compared to those other guys. And so how did we get a big moon? Uh, Mars has a couple of teeny tiny moons, like 50 miles in diameter or smaller. And so there was a lot of speculation about that. Um, uh, one is they just this fission theory is just part of it split off. The problem is is that the materials aren't the same, the composition is not the same, and so if they if part of the if the moon split off from part of the Earth as it was forming, the materials would have been pretty much the same, and they're not. Um, the sister theory says that um, they form together but separately. And the problem with that is that if they form together, um, they would have angular momentum about the same point, and then the moon would end up orbiting along the axis of the Earth's equator, along the Earth's equator, and it's not orbiting along that axis. And so they couldn't have formed together. They can't, so the sister theory doesn't work. Uh, the next one is the capture theory. And the capture theory says the moon was going by, and the Earth just captured it with its gravity. Well, it turns out that's almost impossible, um, especially for an object as large as the moon. It's, uh, the physics kind of prevents that. When, when something comes in, unless it collides, it's going to go back out again. And we have that challenge with our spacecraft, too. And so um, those were the main theories uh, maybe more than 100 years ago, or up to 100 years ago, and they all sort of failed. They had big holes in them. And so about 40 years ago, or 50 years ago, um, the, uh, someone came up with the giant impact hypothesis. I was in college when this came out. It was in the late 1970s or early 80s. And the argument was that um, uh, during the formation of the Earth, it was hit by a Mars, the Earth was hit by a Mars-sized object. So this is in the cratering era, or right at the end of it. Um, and this object had formed somewhere else in the solar system, but got kicked out maybe by Jupiter's gravity or somebody's gravity and got thrown around and uh, end up, ended up colliding with the Earth. Likely it formed in the asteroid belt somewhere. Um, the collision produced, uh, ended up, so it, it smashed into the Earth, 
and then most of it made the moon, and then the rest of it and what was left of the earth reformed into the earth. And so the result was it gave the earth plate tectonics because it broke up the earth's surface. And it explains why the moon doesn't orbit the earth's equator. So the current accepted theory for how the moon got to be where it is is called the giant impact hypothesis. And it's when a Mars-sized object collided with the Earth early in the formation of the solar system. All right, let's talk a little bit about Mercury. So Mercury looks like the moon on its surface. It's got lots of craters and stuff like that. Um, it's got a daytime temperature of roughly uh, uh, 600, degrees, 600 to 800 degrees Fahrenheit. It depends on where you look and uh, minus 270 degrees at night. It has the second most eccentric, eccentric, that is to say the least circular orbit next to Pluto. So of the eight planets, it's got the most eccentric orbit. Its diameter is about 3,000 miles, so it's about the size of the US. It's about 1 20th the mass of the Earth, and it's got roughly the same density as the Earth does. So uh, Mercury is a bright planet, that is to say you can see it if you know where to look. You can often see it right after sunset or right before sunrise. It's close to the sun, so it's well lit. <coughs> it receives about seven times the intensity of light the Earth does. Um, it's also close to Earth, and so that combination makes it pretty easily seen by us. Why isn't it seen so often? Because it's so close to the sun that it's never up long after sunset, and it's never up long before sunrise. It's always right near the horizon when the sun is near the horizon. And so it can be very hard to see. Mercury is too small to have enough gravity to hold on to its atmosphere, and so it has no atmosphere. It's very hot. You can be small and have an atmosphere if you're very cold, so that your molecules in your atmosphere are moving really slow. But Mercury is really hot, and it's small, and so it can't keep its atmosphere. Um, Mercury orbits the Earth in 88 days and have has roughly a 58 day, I think I said 55, anyway, in the 50s it rotates on its axis. And so its day is about 55 Earth days. So Mercury has a large iron core. Its iron core is around 60 percent of its size. That's very large uh, even compared to the Earth which has a large iron core. Um, it has global scarps. Let me let me pull up a couple of pictures here for a second. So there's a picture of uh, of Mercury's core. Um, you can go back and look at what the Earth's core looked like, but it was significantly smaller than that. Um, uh, the Earth's core is about half its radius, and uh, uh, Mercury's is considerably bigger than that. Let's see if I have, do I have any pictures of, uh, yeah, here we go. So you can see a scarp here. So here are craters. This scarp here, this kind of thing occurs when the planet is cooling off and shrinking a little bit, and it kind of wrinkles, and you can see that wrinkle. The wrinkle happened right through the crater, so you can tell that the wrinkle happened after the crater hit, right? Because if the crater hit after the wrinkle, then it would have wiped out that wrinkle. And so you can tell a lot about which craters happen first. Look at this little region here, right? You've got a bigger crater and a smaller crater, and clearly the smaller crater happened second because it wiped out the edge of the bigger crater right down here. Um, so you can tell a lot about what happened when just by looking at uh, how things overlap. But this is a scarp. That's a scarp. Let me just go up here for a second. Um, we used radar to measure the rotational rate of the of 
Mercury. Mercury is low in the sky for us all the time for the reasons I said a little bit ago. As a result of that, it's, uh, it's hard for us to get a good look at its surface with Earth-based telescopes. And so we figured out how it was rotating by bouncing radar off it. And uh, if, if, uh, if it's stationary, the, the frequency of the radar will come back the same uh, as it went out. It'll just bounce off and come back. But if it's spinning, then the part that's coming towards you will bounce radar that's blue shifted, and the part that's going away will bounce radar that's red shifted, and your 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 your, um, your pulse coming back will look like this. So you send a pulse out like like the top one, and then uh, and it'll come back like this if there's no rotation. It'll come back the same way, right? But if it's rotating, um, the, the pulse will be spread out more in terms of frequency because there'll be red shift on one, on one side it's rotating and blue shift on the other side. And so it'll make some of the frequencies faster and some of the frequencies slower or smaller, some of the frequencies larger and some of the frequencies smaller. And so you get a spread out uh, a pulse in terms of frequency. And uh, you can use this to determine the rotation rate. And so that's what was done with Mercury. We bounced radar off it, looked at the returning pulse, and used the Doppler shift to figure out how fast it was turning.